Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the webinar on Conference Room Design Basics. Let me introduce the team. Today's presenters are Anish Samuel, which is myself. I'm from the system application team at Shure Middle East and Africa. Joining me is Ritendra Podar. He is from the system application team, Shure Middle East and Africa. So ground rules for today's webinar. Today's webinar is on BlueJeans platform. Participants, uh, a video and microphone are muted. So we would request you to wear your headphones or earphones for a better results as audio samples are being played as part of the webinar. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to type it in the chat or the Q&A box, and we will answer them at the end of the session. Thank you in advance. So we are going to speak about the webinar setup that we have uh, for today. As we are aware that many people are currently working from home, and most of our work are involving conference calls like Skype, BlueJeans, Teams, etc. We can all agree that audio plays a very important role in AV, concert, uh, in AV conferencing. Say if in a conference call a video fails and audio is still there, you can continue the call. But if the audio fails, there is no way of continuing the communication. A clear audio is therefore a must for effective communication. Otherwise, you know, joining parties need to stress a lot to listen to each conversation, which is not good, you know, if the call needs to go on for hours and hours. It, all, uh, it also affects the productivity and, and the conversation is not going to be very clear. The participants will not be able to understand what is being conveyed and will start joining the dots by guessing what was being said. So as sure, uh, as you may know, you know, we have more than 90 plus years experience in delivering quality audio products. So we would like to reiterate that clear audio is a must for effective communication. To have the effective webinar, we have done our home office setup with our sure motive product line. So right now, I am having a sure MV51 microphone connected via USB with my laptop. I have a headphone and a USB camera connected as well. My colleague Ritendra has a Shure MV5 digital condenser microphone, which is connected via USB. And he has a Shure SRH145 headphone connected and a USB webcam for video. Some key features of the Motive line. The setup is very quick and it supports plug and play. No drivers are required. It is built in with a 3.5 mm headphone output. It is compatible with smartphones, PCs, and Mac. The DSP is built in, you know, with functions like limiter, compressor, and equalizer. The MV5 has like uh, three DSP preset modes, which are like vocal mode, flat mode, and uh, instrument modes. The MV51 has five DSP preset modes, which is speech, singing mode, flat, acoustic instruments, and loud mode. So it can offer seamless integration with all AV applications and soft codecs, such as Skype, BlueJeans, Teams, etc. So MV5 offers flexible mounting options with its microphone's standard threading. Same goes for the MV51, which offers flexible mounting options with its microphone's standard threading. It has a durable touch uh, front panel to ensure longevity. Moving on to today's webinar. The webinar is divided into several modules and are as followed. Module one, a case for better audio quality in meetings. Module two, elements of a conference room. Module three, phases of a room design project. Module four, planning and needs assessment. Module five, Video conferencing and remote participants. Module six, solving common issues to improve intelligibility. And module seven, large rooms and voice lift systems. Last but not the least, testing and optimizing the design. 
Module 1. A case for better audio quality in meetings. This is to better understand why audio quality can and should be improved in a meetings and conference rooms. Let's look at how we can use communication in other aspects of our life. Now, communication is a fundamental part of the human experience. And as we do it continuously uh, throughout our day, communication helps shape the way we think, you know, about uh, ideas, about people, about things. So when we talk about the evolution of communication, over time, technological environments, advancements and societal changes have shifted the way we communicate, particularly in the workspace. So meetings of today are highly collaborative and include a mixture of voice, video and live content. So these are all shared between groups of people across the world. So today it is quite impossible to separate our communication from the technology bit. So when we move on to the business of media and AV technology, as an industry, communication can be big business. So think about the quality of the production in sports, live meeting or news broadcasts. You know, these events are supported by a production staff with ample setup time and cutting edge technology. And as it shows, you know, the, the, the quality of the visuals and the sound design, you know, it's very important. The, the impact on the audience can be huge as well. So while an average, uh, you know, conference me uh, meeting is actually important to the uh, people, it still matters to a lot of the uh, uh, organization and those people who are conducting the meeting. You know, the time, money and effort are actually put into every meeting, which is directly affecting those who are involved in meetings. So what are the benefits of high quality audio in a, a conference room? You know, it might be taken for granted that audio is an important part of communication. Audio interruptions, noises, and hard to hear speech can be very distracting and can easily lead to negative perceptions. So here are a few reasons to uh, to prioritize audio quality in your meeting spaces. So meetings are most productive and collaborative when each person is heard and you know feels like he's an equal member of the discussion. The health and well-being of employees improves when the audio is clear and intelligible. You know, it reduces listening fatigue and exhaustion. And lastly, by enhancing your business's uh, perception by delivering high quality meetings, where everybody is clearly heard and understood, you know, even on the far end of a video call. So how do we measure uh, speech quality? It is important to realize that sound quality is not an absolute term. You know, we, we had this discussion in our previous webinar as well. It depends on the context. So what comprises of good sound will be different from music as opposed to speech. So it is your intuition as per as your intuition may tell you that, you know, all you need is a good sound. You know, uh, all you need for a good sound is accurately, uh, uh, you know, pick up and reproduction. But the truth is actually, you know, success in audio is defined by the situation and the context. The so speech intelligibility you know, can be actually measured by STI or speech transmission index. The STI measures the uh, speech transmission quality, which consists of several aspects of a scenario. So it can be a mixture of speech level, frequency response of a particular channel, you know, background noise level, quality of the sound reproduction equipment, you know, presence of the echo and reverb, and psychoacoustic effects or masking effects. So these ingredients result in the intelligibility of the audio in a very uh, given situation. And later on, when we look at testing and optimizing your installation, you know, we, we can look at acceptable ratings for all these environments, such as, you know, meeting and conference environments. So moving on to the next slide, uh, while we are designing for the room for intelligibility, we need to make sure that the room is a very critical factor in audio quality and meeting performance. You know. Uh, it, it is as shown by uh, the characteristics measured by the STI for speech intelligibility. A well-designed room, you know, provides the ideal environment and set of tools to provide 
intelligible speech for meetings. This is especially important to the integrated systems market environment. You know, you need the CEO's uh, speech, for example, to, to sound great. And you want the learners to fully understand each of the education sessions. You now, to achieve this, anything that interferes with the clear speech and listening needs to be minimized or eliminated. So there are several competing factors at play in a conference room. Uh, you know, competing interests such as room aesthetics, function and money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, challenges can also be introduced uh, by you know the number of participants, the layout of the room, the activity, and the needs of a sound system. So whether or not a video calling is required, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the, the the list can go on. So in addition, uh, the acoustic characteristics of the room have a significant impact on the sound of the speech and the resulting design of the AV system. So this particular webinar, you know, provides you an overview of these and other important considerations to make when you are designing a room for meeting and conferences. So we move on to module two, which is elements of a conference uh, conference room. So for this webinar, we are focusing on what we call as a conference room. The conference rooms are in fact meeting rooms which are common in most organizations and corporations. The conference rooms provides an AV or audio visual system that brings together speech, video and screen sharing between you know, participants. The conference rooms are the place where technically complex and collaborative communication is possible in a simple and natural way. Moving on to the scale and complexity. The term conference room uh, in this particular webinar covers, you know, other more similar terms like boardrooms, huddle rooms and collaboration spaces. So really when it, when it all comes down to the need of the room, uh, that's when you identify whether it is a simple or a complex kind of setup. So when meetings are small and simple, they don't require anything uh, too special, you know, perhaps a group, uh, you know, is reviewing a document or they need isolation to focus on an issue. You know, in this particular uh, scenario, just the basic requirements of the room are, you know, like good acoustics and an acceptable ambient noise level. So as meetings become larger and more complex, the room requires additional, uh, you know, resources to keep the collaboration natural and efficient. The so many medium sized rooms, uh, you know, include video or teleconferencing to connect remote participants. So this in effect creates a large audio system comprised from the two locations. So additional care is required, uh, you know, and tools are required for effective audio experience from both ends. So sometimes even the, uh, the room itself is large enough and, uh, you know, uh, an in-room sound reinforcing system is required so that the people in the room, uh, you know, sitting apart on, on both, uh, you know, the, the near and far side of the room can hear properly. So this is uh, referred to as a voice lift system. And we can use a zoned uh, speaker system to provide enough boost to hear everyone in the room. Now let's talk about the common elements of a conference room. Most obvious is the functional furniture, you know, that is centered, uh, you know, within a room or, you know, mostly the tables, chairs and the display orientation. So the layout of the room is very important as well, and it will also affect the uh, decisions in a room. Uh, and also you have to consider the acoustics and the AV system design. So most rooms can include an AV system also to support video, phone or web calls, you know, screen sharing and media playback and other collaboration tools. DSP or digital signal processing, codec and networking are also included for fine tuning the audio and integration with IT services and support. You know, ideally to an end user, a meeting participant, uh, the system should be very easy to operate and it should deliver consistent results. And lastly, all the rooms should have a degree of interior finishes. So whether it be uh, carpeted floors or like, uh, you know, drop ceilings or sound absorption panels, you know, well-planned rooms can give you uh, success and also it can incorporate, you know, acoustical treatment inside the room and also the it can aid in the aesthetic design of the room. So we are looking at some acoustical finishing, you know, options later on, and we'll discuss tips to improve the sound within a room. 
Now we move on to an example uh, AV scenario. You know, uh, though the exact details of each AV system can could vary, you know, uh, room to room, there are some common AV components that can be found in most rooms. You know, first we have the microphones uh, used to capture speech within a room. So for this uh, particular example, we have the MXA910, you know, ceiling array microphone, which has eight independent, uh, you know, steerable channels. This is connected to a network switch supplying power over Ethernet to the microphone. The switch is connected to a P300 audio conferencing processor, which is connected to the AV device and providing uh, DSP conf you know, uh, processing as well. But a laptop is also connected to the P300, which is uh, running a video conferencing web app with a soft codec. An optional 3.5 mm connection is available on the P300 uh, DSP mixer you know, in case you want to connect to a remote caller. But all these signals are processed and connected to the video conferencing codec and loudspeaker for in-room reinforcement. So moving on to the next module, uh, the phases of a room design project. So there are many considerations when uh, designing an effective conference room. You know, uh, there is a general process that most, you know, projects follow. And, uh, you know, let's walk through all these uh, phases. The so phase one is needs assessment. The so performing a needs assessment is the first step, and it is also deemed as the most important one. So we'll, we'll, we'll be spending some extra time on this, you know, uh, uh, as soon as we get the project overview from the client. So the, the needs assessment provides the direction of your project by determining the real needs of the users. You know, it is balanced against the real constraints of the project. So the real users balanced against the real constraints. Bear that in mind. So it is very important that we don't be discouraged in this step because it can feel uh, a little bit tedious. So a careful and thorough needs assessment will be provided, you know, in order to get the best data to create the room design with utmost accuracy. Moving on to the design phase. So the design phase takes the information gathered in the needs assessment and puts together the plan in much detail, you know. So if this is a completely new room, the design may include aspects of the physical room to improve the acoustics from ground up. Uh, you know, other rooms may only require like a, a simple new microphone and the scope of the design uh, would be, uh, you know, following suit. So there are two different parts uh, this particular project may go down with, you know, beginning with the design. So one uh, is the acute, uh, is the audio consultant route, and the second is the integrator route. So when you are the audio consultant, there are three steps, design, bid, and build. So the extra step of the bid is included in uh, when you are an audio consultant. Since the designer is a consultant and you know, he doesn't act as an integrator. He needs to bid it so that, you know, qualified integrators get the job and execute it, you know, as per the customer requirements and the specs. So the integration route. So integration, uh, it is more, uh, more or less a design and build project. So it doesn't have a bid component. And since the designer also acts as the integrator, you know, he buys, installs, and optimizes the equipment. So uh, moving on to the bid phase, bidding and contracting phase. Uh, the bidding phase actually includes the review and selection of the integration proposal based on the specification. Moving on to the next uh, slide, fabrication and programming. Okay, so in this particular uh, uh, step or phase of the project, the integrator begins assembling the build as per the design specification. The equipment is purchased and assembled off-site, you know, to do, to do uh, as much setup, programming, and testing, whatever is possible. The next phase is called installation and tuning. You know, once the room is ready, it is time to install the audio equipment on-site. So this includes installing each device, you know, connecting the system and testing the audio. So it, it's important to test the system with real people organized in a realistic setup you know, in order to make accurate adjustments. 
The next phase is called sign off and completion. As the project nears the end, the integrator will actually provide operational instructions and handover of any project assets, such as you know default room settings, uh, you know uh, default room settings that meet project specifications, templates or scenes for specific functions, you know any additional training or user guides or operation manuals, etc. It's part of the handover document. The last phase is, is support and service. You know, some project include a, a like a service contract after the installation to to continue helping the client maintain and support the rooms. So this can take many forms. Like you know, it can be a maintenance or you know phone support, contracted uh, you know staff being on site to support the client, or troubleshooting visits, or uh, you know you can have any kind of an SLA based arrangement. So to summarize, uh, this gives us a good idea of the lengthy and uh, collaborative nature of a room design project. You know, this is just to make sure that the project goes well. You know, let's look at some ways to get the best data for starting the project. Uh, that is the needs assessment. Moving on to module four, planning and needs assessments. So before taking any other step, it is important to identify the client needs and the requirement for this space. So any additional decisions, money and time spent should be used to reinforce these needs. So, uh, you know, effective study of the room, the surrounding space, the IT infrastructure, the AV technology and tools, uh, you know, it all should be uh, studied properly. So there are three steps for a successful assessment. You know, we are gonna cover these three steps. Uh, first is investigate. Second is interview and third is educate. So step one, the investigation. So you need to do your homework. So start with the research, you know. The, the goal is to understand the real needs of the new conference room. So this can include the, uh, the, the current facilities and meeting spaces, equipment, tools and services, you know, culture and behavior of the organization that you're catering to. And uh, you know, are meetings or more formal or informal within that organization that you are going to support? And you need to take the uh, you know stakeholders and key collaborators and uh, you know uh, investigate uh, on what is their mode of uh, 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 you know presentation and stuff like that. So this can actually include observing a real presentation or meeting uh, in their uh, you know environment. So what are the meeting space like and how are they being used? It can definitely support you further. So which AV tools are installed already and what are they functioning uh, like, or is it uh, functioning as designed? So is there any dedicated AV staff or do uh, the participant or their IT team directly do the setup and troubleshooting? So you need to check all of that. So all these questions, you know, they can provide insight into the project and the people you, who, whom you are working with. So step two is the interview. Now you need to play the detective. So it is, it is actually human nature to think that we know what we want exactly. So especially early on on a project, you know, it can be very tempting to think about solutions rather than, you know, looking at all the options. So a good way to get past this is, is actually using interviewing techniques, you know, with the client and the end users. So, this is, you know, actually deemed to be a very fun, uh, you know, excuse to play a detective or integrator to, to get the answers that you need to design the project. You know, here are, uh, you know, we, uh, we are going to discuss a few tips to get you uh, interviews to actually get uh, what is the user's real needs and common applications and behavior within a project. So step one, you need to talk to the real end users. So as you begin, uh, you know, asking the tough questions, if the interviewee doesn't know the answer, make sure that you get the person who does know the answer. You know, eventually this will lead you to the real stakeholders that will benefit the most from a good rooms design. Step two is to avoid interrupting or hurrying through the interviewee. You know, uh, sometimes the awkward moments that, you know, can happen during an interview phase, it can actually lead you to a more insightful uh, data that can further help you in your design. Step three, you know, if possible, record the interview and document the interview. So 
So comments, you know, actually make a very powerful data when backing up uh, design decisions at a later stage. And step four in, you know, you have to be respectful of the interviewee's time and, you know, you must do as much research upfront as possible. So remember, you know, they are taking time out of their uh, valuable uh, normal day for you and you need to respect that. And the third step uh, is to uh, for needs assessment is to do uh, is to provide education and teach the masses. To complete the assessment, you know, follow up with stakeholders and walk them through your findings. You know, you need to reinforce it with relevant information from AV conference systems, you know, or room acoustics and industry's best practices. You need to educate them. So as the audio expert, you, ha you can provide valuable considerations and real world knowledge that the client may know very little about. So during this time, you can provide data to reinforce your proposals, calm fears related to audio networking technology, you know, correct misleading or incorrect assumptions, talk about the new technology and design ideas. So as we have discussed, you know, the needs assessment is, is an integral or an invaluable part of a room design project. So however, it requires care and time to make sure that you have understood the client's need. So using the three steps, investigate, interview and educate, you can help extract the information that you need in providing a successful uh, design. So we move on to module five, which is uh, video conferencing and remote participants. So I'm handing over the floor to uh, Mr. Ritten. So he'll be taking you through the uh, rest of the modules. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the chat uh, window or the Q&A window. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Anish. Thanks for sharing your great knowledge and experience. Now let's move to our next topic. Hello, everyone. I am Ritain, uh, Systems Application Engineer from Sure. Um, as it was mentioned earlier that we are going to have a lot of audio demos in this webinar. So please uh, wear the earset or headphone to have the better experience. Um, I would suggest to keep the volume level up at somewhere around 75 to 90 because we're going to have off axis uh, audio demo of the microphone. So you need to hear it uh, clearly. OK, so let's move on. So let's start with the video conferencing. Video conferencing is a powerful way to enhance communication with others in different location. It requires additional considerations like microphone selection and positioning, codec and far end limitations. Talking about near end, far end, there are two subjective terms to define the system. First is the near end. Near end is basically a room the meeting is hosted, so the call is going to start from there. And the second is far end. Far end is the location of the remote caller multiple participants, then all the uh, attendees are going to be the remote caller in that case. So it is an important part to have the right microphone selection, right? In this course, we will go through a few of the microphone basics at high level, and we'll give you the listening examples and discussion during this case, right? So let's start with the microphone characteristics. So I'm just going to go through with the microphone characteristic. So there are two few, uh, there are a few characteristics to consider when choosing the microphone. The first one is the frequency response, and the second one is directionality. So frequency response defines the range of sound that a microphone can reproduce and how its output varies within that range. The frequency response is one of the most significant factors in determining the sound signature of the microphone. The frequency response of a mic is rep represented graphically by a response curve with a range of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And there are two most common types of frequency response. First one is the flat response and the second one is the shaped one. Shaped one is also called as tailored frequency response. The second important microphone characteristic is the directionality, also called the polar pattern. So that the directional directionality determines how the microphone responds to a, to sound from a different direction. The two main types are omnidirectional, also called as omni and unidirectional, or simply directional microphone, right? 
all the microphone in this course discuss directional polar pattern since we are less concerned about the fidelity that comes with an omnidirectional microphone and more concerned with only pick up speech while rejecting distracting ambient noises. Unidirectional microphones have maximum pickup in one specific direction called on axis with increasingly less sensitivity at sound source gets further off axis. Now let's look at common microphone design and their advantages and disadvantages in the conference room. So I'll start with the handheld microphone. So as we already discussed in our previous webinar about the different form factors, so I'm just, I, I don't just want to give you the same info. I'll give you the audio, I'll share the audio samples and we'll demonstrate the audio quality with the microphone. So handheld microphone is useful for presenting and performing. It can be held in hand or you can place on the stand, right? Now, I, I, in this slide, I am just going to demonstrate the audio uh, sample. So the demo has been done with Microflex wireless handheld microphone with the cardioid polar pattern with SM8686 uh, capsule. And as it is the directional polar pattern, so sound will vary with the distance. So just bear with me. I'm going to play the audio demo. Please wear the headphone to have the better uh, experience of the demo. This is a sample recording of a Shaw MXW handheld radio microphone with an SM86 capsule, which has a cardioid pickup pattern. This microphone is most sensitive directly in front of the capsule. It's less so at 45 degrees off axis, even less at 90 degrees off axis, and most rejection at 180 degrees off axis. The microphone is also sensitive close to the sound source and ever less sensitive the further away it becomes. The microphone is now arm's length away from my mouth. Great. Hope you understood how exactly the polar pattern behaves if if it if the microphone is away from the talker in different angle. Now let's move on to the next one, boundary microphone. Boundary microphone offer discrete and low profile. It can also have optional mute button and LED indicators, right? And it can cover multiple participants. We recommend to have one one microphone with one participant. It can be shared as well if the budget is the concern. So let's move on to the audio audio sample of boundary microphone. So the audio has been recorded with our Microflex wireless boundary microphone MXW6 with cardioid polar pattern. Microphone is great, but there are some kind of limitation which you need to consider in this kind of uh, form factor. It can pick up the table sound that is going to be on the table. It's a tabletop microphone. It can pick up the sound from the table, keyboard, mice, or paper rustling on the table, right? If in case you are having a laptop in front of the microphone, so laptop can block the mic and reduce the high end frequency. So your sound is going to be somehow muffled, not very clear. So let's move on to the audio demo. I'll play the audio demo again. Just bear with me. This is a sample recording of a Shure MXW boundary microphone with a cardioid pickup pattern placed on a table at arm's length. The microphone is most sensitive directly in front. It's less sensitive at 45 degrees, even less at 90 degrees, and least sensitive at 180 degrees. As the mic is placed on the table close to other objects, it can pick up sounds from keyboards, mice, and other unwanted noise, such as paper rustling. Another issue we see with boundary microphones is when room users put their laptops between themselves and the microphone and raise the screen, which cuts off the high-end content. An example of this is if I raise my laptop screen to obscure the microphone from my voice, you can hear that the high-frequency content is now lost. As soon as I close the laptop screen, the full audio spectrum is restored. Great. Hope the demo clarifies the way microphone works. 
Now let's move on to our next slide. That's all about Guznik microphone. Guznik pro microphone provides good gain before feedback as the microphone is going to be closer to the talker because of the stem. Uh, it, sh it reaches above, above, over the laptop and books because the, the, the stem of the Guznik is going to take care of uh, the, the capsule to be come closer to the, to the talker. And you can have mute button and light ring indicator with such microphone. So talking about the audio demo, I'll take you through the audio demo of our Microflex wireless Guznik microphone MXW8 with cardioid polar pattern. The benefit of having uh, the Guznik microphone is it can be away from the table noise. It can come closer to the talker. It is having some kind of uh, consideration is uh, consideration basically it affect it is affected by the head turning. So if you move your head, the the if you are going away from the directionality of the polar patterns, yeah. And the other thing what we have noticed in most of the uh, meeting environment that people as it is closer, people tend to play with the gooseneck, and that is also getting picked up with in a in a conference call. So let's go through the audio demo of gooseneck microphone. This is a sample recording of a short MXW gooseneck microphone with a cardioid pickup pattern. It's placed on the table in front of me at arm's length. It's most sensitive directly in front, less so at 45 degrees, even less at 90 degrees, and least sensitive at 100 and a little degrees. As a capsule is away from the table, it will pick up less noise from a keyboard and a microphone compared to the boundary microphone but it does suffer from, as I turn my head away to talk away down the table, the sound tonality changes. Another phenomenon we see with gooseneck microphones is room users tend to play with them or interact with them with no regard to what might be heard at the far end. Okay, now let's move to the microphone which solves all these problems. Yeah, so the next type of the microphone is array microphones. Array microphone offers non-obtrusive design with mounting completely off the table. It offers eight, it offers a steerable coverage with eight different polar patterns to aim the audio coverage. You can have multiple channels and that can be turned on and off with the Intellimix built in with the microphone, right? Going forward, let's, let's, have a, the have the audio sample of array microphone i just want to emphasize over here that uh, as it is away from the table you will be having less noise of the table and there is no such issues of user adjustment because it's on ceiling yeah and it's also less impacted by head movement because the lobe is always going to cover you regardless of uh, how far you go in that lobe area right so let's go through the audio sample of MXA910. This is a sample recording of an MXA910 mounted at a height of 2.39 meters in a room which is 5.2 meters by 7.4 meters. There's one wall of glass, one wall of windows with the blinds closed and two plasterboard walls. There is also a boardroom table and leather chairs. The sound in this room is acoustically dead without being unnatural. The MXA910 is configured to use one narrow lobe and I'm sat approximately 1.5 meter from the mic. EQ and noise reduction is turned off. Great. Now, hope it clarifies the way the microphone picks up, right? Now let's move on to the next slide. Critical distance. In this slide, you see that the microphone is dependent on the critical distance. And what is critical distance? Let's talk about this. Whichever microphone you choose, make sure to position it correctly for the best result. The critical distance is the distance at which the direct sound from a speech and the ambient noise and the reverberation are of equal intensity. Remember, it's of equal intensity. 
yeah beyond that distance the microphone no longer picks up enough and doesn't sound intelligible for a speech level right to to estimate the critical distance of a microphone and its the surrounding environment we use an omnidirectional microphone to determine our starting point and give this value as 1 okay in this slide omnidirectional has given the value of 1 as the microphone pattern becomes more directional it increases the value since a directional microphone by nature rejects sounds outside the pickup pattern area as cardioid microphone has a critical distance 1.7 times the distance of an omnidirectional microphone from the sound source when the Shure MXA 910 ceiling array microphone is set to a narrow width, it has a value of 4 due to its highly directional low pattern. Okay. Now, talking about the codec, it is important to know how codec affects the streaming quality of the video and audio signal. A codec is a device or application for encoding or decoding additional data at both ends of the call. Remember, a codec is a combined word of encoder and decoder is required for the real time transport transfer of audio and video between rooms. Different codecs standard exist and the best standard shared between the rooms is chosen. As mentioned earlier, this means that even if one room has the best hardware codec, it will be forced to select a lower standard depending on the connecting call. Right, the so codec plays very important role and its quality as well. Now let's move on to the next topic, and the topic is solving common issues to improve intelligibility. Okay, there is a saying in audio industry: "Don't wait to fix it in the mix." This means that there are many steps along the way to a recording, and identifying and fixing problem upfront will make everything easier and less costly to fix down the line. This also applies to a room acoustics in conference room performance. While it may be tempting to buy a different microphone or more expensive processors, DSP processors, the best investment you can make is into improving the acoustic of the room up front. Making a positive change at the beginning of the signal chain impacts the entire system performance. So no need to wait to fix in the mix you can you can work on treating the room properly and that can help a lot and then you hardly need to look on the dsp processing so there are four ways to improve the room performance and i'm going to talk about this so first one is the acoustical theory second is interior finish and treatment then the third is to reduce the ambient noise of the room and the fourth, the last but not the least, is digital signal processing. By the way, if you take care of first three parts of improving the room performance, you hardly need to work on DSP side. Acoustical theory, interior finish, reducing ambient noise will help a lot. So it's just a matter of routing the audio and do some kind of little adjustment in digital signal processing will do the job. So let's, let's talk about the first one, design with acoustical theory in mind. You have to follow these acoustical design in tips. First, avoid parallel surfaces. Parallel surfaces creates the standing waves and it creates the reflection. So that affects the intelligibility uh, of the microphone pickup. Use dense building material that limit outside noise. We have seen many meeting rooms where the, the, the end user is having issues listening the ambient noise, listening the outside no noise in the room. So having the dense building material can help in that. Limit reflective surfaces. For example, hardwood or glass, glass walls, hardwood like uh, reflective tables and chairs. Limit that and that can help in improving the acoustical part of the room. Now, talking about acoustical issues, the, the biggest challenge and the issue is the reflections. And reflections are particularly a problem in the conference room and it happens because of layout or maybe the aesthetics. So talking about the layout, table and hardwood surfaces can create the reflection. Large marker board on wall can create the reflection. Existing electrical and network infrastructure as well. In terms of aesthetics, glass walls and windows creates reflection. Non-absorptive ceilings, decorations, 
concave walls and ceiling as well. So I'm just going to give you a demo of a noisy room, which is having a lot of reflection and the audio has been recorded with our MXC910 ceiling array microphone. Let's listen to it. This is a sample recording of a Shaw MXA910 ceiling array microphone. It's mounted at a height of 2.39 meters. The room I'm in is 5.8 meters by 3.73 meters. It has three walls of glass and one plasterboard wall. There are minimal furnishings. As you can hear, the sound is quite reverberant. The mic is configured to use one narrow lobe pointed at me and I'm sat approximately 1.5 meters away from the mic. EQ and noise reduction are both turned off. Great. Now let's move on to our next slide. So, Having the interior finish for the room treatment, examples like carpeting, acoustical ceiling tile, hanging baffles. Hanging baffles are, are in trend nowadays. Many acoustical consultant are choosing this type of ceiling, what you see in this slide. It looks nice and it improves the acoustical uh, situation of the room a lot. Having the movable partition, partitions with, with the acoustical material, acoustical foam, Treating and furniture with the soft absorbing material helps a lot to treat the room in terms of acoustic. So let's listen to another audio demo where the, the microphone is going to be same, but the room is treated. So that will give you a kind of idea of what exactly you can do if you treat the room acoustically. So just bear with me. I'm just going to play the audio file. This is a sample recording of an MXA910 mounted at a height of 2.39 meters in a room which is 5.2 meters by 7.4 meters. There's one wall of glass, one wall of windows with the blinds closed and two plasterboard walls. There is also a boardroom table and leather chairs. The sound in this room is acoustically dead without being unnatural. The MXA910 is configured to use one narrow lobe and I'm sat approximately 1.5 meter from the mic. EQ and noise reduction is turned off. Great. So I hope you understood what exactly you can do by treating the room. And audio samples justify that. Now, this, talk, this slide is about style with function. Nowadays, interior designers are well educated and they know what exactly can happen if you treat the room properly for such kind of meeting room, boardroom and conference room. To show you some examples here, uh, in this slide, picture number one is showing the wall with acoustical panel. Looks nice, right? And it is also solving the acoustical purpose of the room. The second picture in the middle is showing hanging acoustical panel. Uh, if you see just Without thinking about it, it looks like a designer uh, ceiling, but that is also managing the acoustical uh, condition of the room and absorbing unnecessary reflection. The third picture, what you see here is hanging baffles. Hanging baffles looks nice and it's helping a lot in absorbing unnecessary reflections and reverberation, right? Now let's move to the next topic about reducing the ambient noise. There are common items that adds to the noise floor in a conference room, for example, heating, ventilation and air conditioning, HVAC noise, projectors fan, that can be noisy as well, AV equipment if the rack is, 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 is placed in the room itself and that's having fan and all, that can add ambient noise, computer triping, people rustling, outside traffic, construction or other activity can also be the part of the ambient noise. So now it is very important to manage these ambient noise, to reduce these ambient noise. So I'm just going to talk about topic over here that's called noise criteria. To better understand ambient noise and the noise floor, we look 
at one of the most common standard noise criteria. So noise criteria or NC curves are a standard for measuring noise floor, also called background noise in a space. The value pr produced can be equated with averages of common places. For example, if you talk about recording studio, which is designed with even more precision and care is rated around somewhere of 15 to 20, Restaurant range is somewhere around 40 to 45, and conference room fall in between around 25 to 30. It's very hard to have 25 to 30, but still, if you can manage to have the meeting room, conference room at 40 to 45, you are safe. Your, your room can have better audio intelligibility by applying a couple of audio processing blocks. Now, talking about HVAC system, we mostly think that HVAC system produce the low frequency that that is basically uh, uh, happening with the HVAC system. But no, HVAC system also produce high frequency. So low frequencies are caused because of the mechanical noise of the system and high frequency is because of air speed uh, and all. So what is the solution to to eliminate the low frequency from the from the audio system? You can apply low shelf EQ, you can apply noise reduction in DSP, you can limit the open microphone. Having more microphone open means that you're adding a lot of ambience uh, to the system. Having less number of microphone open will help to improve the, the intelligibility. Talking about high frequency, you can also manage high frequency by applying high shelf EQ, use array or directional microphone. Directional microphone will be having the narrow pickup that will try to reject unnecessary ambience of the room and, and gives you better intelligibility. Now, let's, let's have an audio sample of HVAC, uh, uh, a microphone recording, which is with HVAC on and HVAC off, right? So just, be, just bear with me, I'm just gonna play the audio sample for that. One second. One lobe of MXA 910 with air conditioning off. One lobe of MXA 910 with air conditioning turned on. Okay. I'm sure it was clear enough to, to notice that what happens if the HVAC is on? It adds the necessary air uh, airflow in the microphone that is that is not acceptable for a conference call. So now let's move to the next way of solving the acoustical things of the room is with the digital signal processing. Yeah, this is the last method what we can what you can apply if your room is having acoustical challenges and you can't manage those things like reducing the ambient noise, uh, helping in reducing the reflection and reverberation, then you need to deal with the digital signal processing. As we discussed DSP processor blocks in this slide, uh, we are gonna demonstrate the, the audio quality, uh, what you can have after applying the audio processing in the DSP blocks, right? So the first thing is gain and gain structure. Gain is basically the adjustable level at the input stage of a device. Maintaining appropriate gain structure is essential to create a good sounding uh, audio system. Poor gain structure can lead problem and noise issues, including artifacts and distortion in audio signal. So I'm gonna give you a few tips to keep it in mind when adjusting the gain. First, what you need to care is aim for nominal levels. Starting with the mic input, all the way through the endpoints, loudspeaker. Gain must be considered at each device in the signal chain. Too much gain leads to distortion, remember that. And not even enough gain leads to poor performance of EQ, noise reduction, AAC processing. Yeah, gain must be considered every piece of equipment in the signal chain, okay? Now, let's move to the next equalization. Equalization or EQ is useful for reducing and boosting frequency in a given channel or mix. I'll give you a few tips for best result. Please keep these tips in mind when EQing a signal, okay? First, cut or reduce first. 
then if necessary make any boosting adjustment for example like if your room is noisy so first cut the low end and high end and then if you feel like the audio is not clear so you can play with adjusting the low end or mid high mid high is mostly recommended because that's more on the audio intelligible frequency of human voice right so the human voice mainly reside between 200 to 8000 8, hertz with a speech clarity around 1k to 5k yeah EQ is effective for reducing low end HVAC mechanical vibration and high end HVAC air noise. Okay. Now I'm going to play an audio sample here to make you understand how exactly EQ works when you are having such situations. So bear with me. I'm going to play that audio sample. One lobe MXA 910 with EQ contour off. One lobe of MXA 910 with EQ contour high pass. One lobe of MXA 910 with EQ contour low shelf. One lobe of MXA 910 with EQ contour multiband. One lobe of MXA 910 with EQ contour off. Okay. I guess someone is having microphone open that's creating the necessary noise in this webinar. So please clear the microphone. Okay. So now next let's move to the next audio block. That's AEC, acoustic eco cancellation. So the next audio block is AEC, acoustic eco cancellation. Uh, we are having issue with the audio. Somebody is sorry to jump in. Uh, Muhammad Abdo has his microphone on. Can you please mute your microphone? Sorry guys, please uh, please mute your microphone if you're on if you're having the microphone open right now. Um, that's affecting the the the, the quality. Okay, so now let's let's move to our next audio block, AEC, acoustic echo cancellation. To understand that, first we need to understand what is echo. So I'll give you a simple example. If you're in a conference call, you're speaking in front of the microphone, the audio goes through the conferencing codec to the far end, and at the far end, you're gonna have the audio, the, the far end listener will listen your uh, speech or audio through the speaker, and if the microphone is closer to the speaker, the microphone will pick your audio and then it will be sent back to the room, to your room. And then if you, and that is getting, that will be played by the speaker. So you hear your voice with some latency, that's called echo in a conference call. So how to solve that? Solve this, you have to have AEC in your DSP processing. So AEC is having the option to give the, the reference of your far end output. You give the reference, the microphone, uh, the DSP block will understand, okay, I don't need to listen this, whatever is coming back to the system and it, uh, it just cancel that out. So that's AEC. So let's, let's have a look and listen to the, the audio demo uh, of the AEC block. What happens when you're on a conference call and how to solve this, okay? So let's listen to the audio sample. This is a sample recording of the echo cancellation process within P300. I have a far end participant on this conference call 
uh, with echo cancellation turned off. Uh, hello. Hello from the far end. Oh, I can hear myself. This might be a little bit difficult. Um, can I try and fix this, please? Now I've enabled the echo cancellation process in P300, and you can no longer hear the far end participant in my microphone feed. So let's try this again. Okay, yeah, this is a lot better now. I cannot hear myself, um, so we can have this conversation uh, with a lot more ease now. Great. I hope that clarifies what happens when you have the room is having echo and how to how exactly it can be solved. Now let's move on to the next audio block of the DSP that's noise reduction. Noise reduction determines which frequencies are constantly present and eliminates them when them from the signal. It leaves the room for transient changing frequency, which is speech. Noise reduction is particularly helpful for reducing HVAC background noise. So I'm going to play the audio sample in, in a noisy room environment and then please uh, listen at how exactly the noise reduction can reduce the unnecessary noise of the room. Okay, we are with me. Sorry, I'm kind of glitch. P300 noise reducer off. P300 noise reducer set to low. P300 noise reducer set to medium. P300 noise reducer set to high. P300 noise reducer set to off. Great. I'm sure you noticed the difference when the noise reduction is on and when exactly it is off. Yeah, we are very proud of our noise reduction and what we offer with our Intellimix P300 TSP. Okay, now let's move to the next audio block. That's auto mixing. So automatic mixing basically helps reduce noise by turning down or off a news mic in the room. This ensures more gain before feedback and lower noise floor. In our DSP sample, let's listen to the automatic mixing applied to our MXA910 with eight channels of audio. So I'll play the audio sample again. This is an MXA 910 with eight open loads summed together as a single output. This is the same lobes from the same MXA 910 run through a gated auto mixer with one open lobe and all unopened lobes at minus 25 dBs. Back to manual mode with eight open lobes, no auto mixing. Great. Now let's move to the next slide. And here we are gonna give you the complete experience of having the audio processing blocks. So, I'm going to play another audio sample. I'll now demonstrate how adding each process in turn can radically improve intelligibility in this microphone pickup. The first thing I'll do is turn on noise reduction for each lobe. Already you can hear that the sound is much clearer. I'll now engage the auto mixer 
to highlight one lobe and suppress seven others. Even more background noise has now been suppressed and my voice is much clearer. Finally, I'll add some parametric EQ to shape the tone to sound as I like it. I've added low end to bring body back to my voice and cut out some of the super high frequencies to minimize sibilance. You can now hear that this is a very clear and comfortable audio signal to listen to on a video conference. Okay, so I hope you understood, you learned what exactly you can do with the DSP by applying different audio blocks. Uh, for best result, working with acoustical consultant helps a lot. Whenever possible, a professional acoustical consultant will provide a valuable input to the architectural design of the room. Tip, early involvement is the key. Again, early involvement is the key. If the room is ready, everything is done, furniture are placed, wall is designed, then it becomes quite challenging to treat the room. And then you just need to rely on the audio processing DSPs. Yeah, now let's move to the next topic large room and voice lift system. If, if you're having a large room where the participants are sitting at distance, so it will be very hard for the listener to listen to the talker who is sitting almost 20, 30 feet away from the talker. Yeah, so for that kind of room, you need to look on the voice lift system. Let's talk about how does the voice lift work? Voice lift, it's basically a sound system that provides just enough sound reinforcement in a room so the farthest listener can hear as well as the closest, yeah? Voice lift is nothing but it's just the compensation for natural loss over the distance, yeah? It increases the intelligibility with minimum amount of gain. To achieve this, you have to have a proper speaker zones. You have to have multiple speaker zones to have more controls on your on your output. Uh, in this particular side, as you can see that there is a talker who is speaking with the gooseneck microphone and the speaker next to her is off. And it's it's practical, right? If, if the listener is sitting just next to the talker, you don't need to listen through the speaker. The listener can easily listen to the talker without having any technology involved. Now talking about the farthest listener who is having a speaker and that speaker is on. Why? Because over the distance, the intelligibility and the, the sound pressure level will, will reduce up to some extent. And the, the difficulty is going to be there for listening by the audience. So at that point, you have to speaker, you have to have the speaker on. Having more zones can help to, to maintain the mix minus properly, right? So mix minus is the key for having such kind of system. More zones, less feedback. What does it mean is you have to have, if you're having more zone, you have more control on the speakers and you can easily do the mix minus to have the proper uh, outcome from the system. When we say zones, it doesn't mean that one speaker requires one zone. You can have a group of speakers all together as one zone. The only thing what you need to remember over here is whenever your specific microphone of that specific zone is on, you should, you should keep the zone speakers of that zone off or at very low level. So that helps to have the voice lift system. Uh, we have uh, our PagNet calculator tool on our website. It helps a lot to understand what exactly and whether it is possible to have the voice lift or no. The, the minimum distance from the talker to the listener should be at least 25 feet for applying our ceiling array microphone to do the voice lift. Right. So if you are having questions in your mind, whether the microphone, our ceiling array microphone can do the, do the voice lift or no, we recommend to go to this tool and enter all the values. For example, number of open microphone, talker to father listener, microphone to loudspeaker, and it will give you the calculation of potential acoustic gain and needed acoustic gain. It is always going to have, uh, you should have potential acoustic gain higher than the needed acoustic gain. Then only you can do the voice lift. So the calculator gives you the value in three different color, green, orange, and red. 
green means okay you can do that orange means possible but yeah you need to look on that but red it will not work at all right so that can give you an idea what exactly you can do with different microphones now the next topic is testing and optimizing the room design okay so we always recommend to have the sound check when you are configuring the system everything is ready you are on site so we always recommend to do the sound check sometime you will be having a situation where you will be blamed for your system saying the audio is not sounding good right so at that point it is always good to have the 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 sound check you can have suppose you have ceiling array microphone or dante based microphone you can use dante headphone dante headphone amp to route audio directly from the microphone and you can listen through the headphone so that eliminates at least one point where you can say my audio whatever is coming from the system is clear now the issue can be somewhere else so over there we recommend to have the listening at various point in the signal path so if microphone is giving crystal clear audio or uh, acceptable audio intelligible audio then it is always better to listen to different uh, layers for example pre mix in dsp post mix or the signal whatever is going to go to the video conferencing correct yeah so that can justify the problem where exactly it is and you can easily troubleshoot that you can also do tpa test to to understand the intelligibility of the room right so what is this tpa tpa is speech transmission index for public address system it is an intelligibility rating for meeting room conference room any kind of audio any kind of space where you want to run the audio system so the scale of tpa is in the range of 0 to 1 0 means bad 1 means excellent meeting room boardroom conference room falls under the range of somewhere around 0.64 to 0.68 talking about recording studio which is the the best room uh, which is going to be the best room for any kind of audio system for recording and any other kind of stuff so that requires the sti range of 0.76 or higher right you'll be amazed to know that if your room is acoustically treated and uh, you use our mxa ceiling array microphone it offers you stepa a in in that situation right so how do we measure the stepa to measure the stepa you have to have the audio tool which can measure stepa and you need to run stepa test tone so stepa test tone is not the human voice but it is having all the frequency ranges what falls under human voice range okay so you play that and then that gives you the value accordingly so i will just play the last video which uh, sorry audio which will give you the experience of stepa test tone okay so so this is the stepa test tone and that you need to play to have the stepa rating now that's all about it we are done with all our modules so in this course by now you should be able to know about basically describe common elements of conference room overcome common challenges of ev conference room design identify with and work with key collaborators perform a need analysis to identify requirement and need needs of the client identify solution to improve his speech intelligibility in a conference room yeah so that's all about it hope this course was informative and you guys can apply in your system design and stay tuned for our next webinar which is going to be next week same day same time from same place at my home office yeah thank you very much guys and take care stay safe